Julie Johnson, um, Director of Comms Planning at Butler Shine Stern and Partners, based in Sausalito, California. I'm Natalie Hayes. Uh, Columbia Sports is actually in Portland, Oregon. Um, and I've been with Columbia for about nine years. Eight of those, or nine of those, nine of those. working with Julie. So we have a long-standing relationship of figuring out better and better ways to execute against our uh, Columbia campaigns. Uh, so with that, I'm gonna, um, Columbia's been around since 1938. I'm sure many of you probably are owners of Columbia Sportswear, some sort of product in your closet. Um, we've been through a lot of change from a marketing standpoint in the last 10 years that I've been there. Um, we're gonna play, at some point, a quick yeah, video. <laughs> um, that kind of walks through where we are as a brand today. Um, obviously, we're gonna talk about media, but we wouldn't be anywhere from a media standpoint and our media choices without some storytelling. So this is a good kind of two minute um, overview of where we are as a brand, and I'll talk about later how this transitions into our media choices. This is Portland, Oregon, in the Pacific Northwest. This is the type of weather you can expect from Portland. This is a sunny day. This is a windy day. This is a stormy day. This is a really, really stormy day. This is Columbia Sportswear Company, where they design, build, and test products for days like that in Portland for people that enjoy mountaintops, river trips, skiing, camping, climbing, surfing, fishing, running. <sighs> anyway, this is Gert Boyle, chairman of Columbia Sportswear. Gert is commonly referred to as Ma Boyle. Oh, I hate that Ma stuff. Or one tough mother. The tough mother? Well, that I don't mind. Her favorite part about living in the Pacific Northwest is the weather. It's the perfect testing ground for Columbia's products. The only thing she loves more than the weather is her son, Tim. This is Tim. He is the most handsome, incredible, intelligent person. He's my son. What the hell? What am I going to say? Tim's a sportsman. Can you move with her out? He's also a good sport. When Gert wanted to test a product, really test it, she called Tim. We have differences sometimes. Gert once put Tim through a car wash. Tim was hesitant. I voted against that. What better person to tell you that your product is good than your mother? Together, Tim and Gert produced and tested, and the more they tested, the more improvements and discoveries they made. If, and only if, a piece of gear passed all these tests, would Gert give it her legendary seal of approval. This was Gert's guarantee that a product was tested tough against every type of terrible, no good, day ruining, pain inducing, career ending condition the skies of the mighty Pacific Northwest will dish out. 20 years later, and Gert is still at it. It's perfect, now make it better. This is the command handed down by Gert. Sure, it makes life hell for Columbia employees, but it means great gear for you. To this day, when customers see Gert's iconic, tested, tough stamp of approval, they know they're duly equipped to stay outside, long after the featherweights have retreated indoors. So, what's next for Columbia? I don't know. Well, Gert certainly isn't going anywhere. At 91, she still gets up to go to work and keep the tested, tough ethos alive at Columbia. Yes, I do. Early to bed, early to rise, work like hell and advertise. She also had to be here for this interview. Thanks, Gert. <laughs> tested tough in the Pacific Northwest. Um, so as you can see, uh, advertising, and particularly TV advertising, has been a huge part of our DNA for a really long time. Uh, Gert does come into the office every day, for those of you who are wondering. I have been in the office when she has literally, the phone has rang, she picks it up and puts it down. So she definitely gives her attention to the person sitting in front of her. Um, so this is just, um, like we said, the story, like I said, the storytelling has really been a huge part of the DNA. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit later about how that tra transition has happened, obviously. Um, early in the, earlier in the last two decades, it was really based in traditional TV. Um, and that is what the organization sort of knows and has come to understand. So we're going to talk a little bit later about um, how that's transitioned to programmatic. So just to give a little heads up on the um, brand architecture, Tested Tough, as you saw, has been a core part of our messaging strategy. Um, over the last few years, we've really made sure in all executions, particularly in TV, where we use that storytelling to kind of pay off that Tested Tough idea. 
um, as well as the consumer benefit that sort of plugs underneath that. So Columbia is really in the business at the end of the day of keeping people outdoors longer, um, and that's keeping people warm, dry, cool, and protected. So we look for opportunities to make sure that that message is coming across. And then obviously reasons to believe being our um, technologies and paying that off. Um, historically, um, so we've, prior to the Tested Tough kind of campaign and the resurgence of that, we used product advertising primarily in a lot of those channels. So we really kind of flipped the script, made sure that that brand message is coming out there, um, and then used just the, just the other channels from a multi-channel standpoint of really showing how else we're executing against that um, promise. This is where we do a lot of the product advertising, where we're getting a little bit closer to the purchase funnel. So, in, so we're gonna talk about spring 16, so this past spring. Um, we're gonna talk about the goals there and then obviously how programmatic um, helped pay that off. So number one goal, um, like I've been mentioning, was to kind of continue to deliver that um, brand affinity, that positive sentiment that we're seeing coming through with the Tested Tough messaging. Um, certainly driving demand for rainwear. So spring is a season when, um, and maybe I should t take a step back for a second, Columbia generally advertises in sort of two main seasons, fall with an outerwear message generally, um, and then again in spring, which has been a varied message, but this last spring really we went in with a concerted effort around raising awareness and consideration around rainwear um, and generating that top of mind awareness. So when someone's in market, when they walk into a Dick Sporting Goods, we want them to think about Columbia first. And then certainly del deliver efficient media coverage. So we have um, lesser of a budget in spring um, than we do in fall, and that has to do with where the prime war <coughs> prim priority of the business is. Um, so we really have to make sure that we're delivering efficiency with the spring. So again, we'll talk about how programmatic TV relates to that. The new Outdry jacket, tested tough in the Pacific Northwest. So you can see, obviously, still messaging that tested tough ethos, paying it off with product, driving that consideration, hopefully, um, around rain, rain wear, and then again, just a look at the multi-channel way we executed against this um, from a campaign standpoint. So it's not mentioned, um, we are in outerwear in the fall, and we know that snow and that foul weather really drives that purchase. And we're able to go in on a local market level where we see that winter weather come in. When that challenged us with the rainwear initiative, we kind of looked at the situation of rain and we saw it's really raining everywhere. So we couldn't really heavy up in local markets the same way we traditionally do fall. So that was kind of a big issue we went into, knowing that spring had a smaller budget, but yet the opportunity was everywhere across the United States in that rain, kind of rainy season. So for us, it was all about owning dry, owning that need state. Instead of going in on that local market level, we wanted to own the need state of the consumer, and regardless of the geography and the footprint and which, what market they're in. We still, though, needed to cover off on core markets. So we had about 18 markets we identified through a market analysis that kind of showed that was the, the big opportunity to drive product. That's where a lot of the product was based in those 18 markets. But we wanted to make sure we still had that reach on a national footprint level. We had a pretty diverse media mix. Um, TV, we had that TV asset. We knew that we needed to go into market with TV type of media play. But we also were cross-screen on desktop, tablet, and mobile with other assets that were more about the, the product story as well as social, telling more of that humorous play in um, quick kind of um, small form assets that continued that tested tough storytelling. But for us, our goal in TV was really to drive our brand attributes and drive that consideration in market. So that was really our hero play in market. We have been in TV um, over the last several years consistently in fall and had great learnings of what we need to do in market with TV um, to achieve the levels we need to, to deem it a success in market. 
we know that which re frequency we need to hit. Um, how do we drive that seasonal campaigns? And from prior research, we saw that TV is that driver in market um, post exposure of that awareness. We also always want to be part of the best programming. Knowing that the DVR effect is real, we want to make sure that we're in live programming. People are paying attention to our TV assets, that they're not flipping the switch or fast forwarding through our TV spots. But we want to also open up to just day parts that were key. We've also been a big proponent in local sponsorships, really tying ourselves to conversations that are relevant, local sports, local <coughs> weather reports. As I said earlier too, we know exactly the TRP levels that we need to be at in our markets to see the success. So we had a lot of historical learnings in TV that made it a very comfortable place for us to keep on investing our dollars. But the challenge for us was that going on into market with our standard TV buy was not gonna be enough for us. The Rainware initiative was broad. Our strategy was really to align with rain, which is everywhere. How can we be everywhere in TV with the budget that we had? Um, and still maintain that local heavy up as well as sponsorships. So the solve, this is where it gets interesting. We explored really three different scenarios. The first one was national TV. It was asked of us, what would it look like if we went national? The answer was one week. <laughs> That's not gonna work. <clears throat> It was extremely low TRP levels. We're not having impact at the reach frequency we needed to be at. And we also were able to only have generic targeting, the standard TV targeting of demo, day part, and network. Then we looked at local TV. We were able to afford four markets. Not that ideal, but okay. We, we, did, we could identify four markets that mattered most. In market for a little bit longer, six weeks, we're getting there. Um, six weeks is decent when we're flighting our weight in market. Solid TRP levels, decent reach frequency levels, but again, the same generic targeting that standard TV gets you. So we said, what if? What if we invest all of our TV dollars in programmatic TV? I was a little ner um, nervous at first, um, but we are able to get national and local market footprint on all of those 18 markets that we had identified of where we need to have our heaviest weight. In market for eight weeks, that's definitely better than six. And we're able to buy based on our audience. Not just buy adults 18 to 49 in, in certain day parts, but really use the data that we had on our target. So credit card, we know that they're shopping at Dick's Sporting Goods, we know they're in market. Online behavioral data, we know that they um, are shopping and, and more likely to be needing a rainwear. But we had to do some selling in. We had a solid story. We didn't know exactly what that weight would get us. Um, and this is the first time that we've gone um, to the executive team for not to sell in of what is programmatic TV. We've been heavily invested in programmatic digital, social. We've been in the programmatic space for the last several years and since 2012, actually. But this was the first time um, taking kind of this whole traditional TV model and flipping it on its head. So we had to do some selling. Yeah, this was an interesting one. As you saw, our CEO, Tim, is well aware of TV. He had practically been buying it himself back in the day, let alone being featured in this ad. So going from a completely traditional standpoint to, um, to really communicating and socializing the benefit of this, to let's take all of this budget and, and put it over here. Uh, there was some understanding of it because we had, I think, done an okay job of selling it in from a digital standpoint, how we buy online. Um, online inventory, um, but this was a whole, whole new world for sure as far as um, that socialization for TV. So we really boiled it down to sort of three main points. Um, using that data uh, to buy ads within TV content, so talking about that, um, talking about the benefit of being able to, um, to show ourselves in a variety of platforms, so we're not just limited to like that one screen, now we're going to be on all screens. Um, the efficiency metric of buying one-to-one -one versus mass. Um, this is ultimately what upper management cared a lot about. This, I think, was probably the selling point for it um, in terms of talking about how our dollars are gonna be used to reach that, that person when they're in the market, when it's raining, when they're most potentially predisposed to actually needing a jacket, um, wanting a jacket. 
Um, and then um, obviously talking about it just from a consumer standpoint and really having education around, look, you're doing these behaviors yourselves, executive team, you probably just don't even know it <laughs> in terms of how you're consuming that media. Um, so yeah, so we, we did that and um, I think with, with some success, they're, they're definitely speaking the language a little bit more than they used to be. So evaluating what our options could look like when it came to programmatic TV, we really boiled it down to three big buckets. Now, we don't claim to be the experts in, in bucketing what programmatic TV is. Um, so there could be discussion around, is this the right buckets? But this is what we chose to do and look at. There's the addressable side of things. There's the high index linear DVR and VOD and working with those cable companies. And then the connected um, screens, so Roku, um, Apple TV, and Hulu, and being in those areas. Um, so we evaluated all three and really came to the decision based on the, the budget we had at hand and what we were willing to test at that moment was the high index linear and connected. Um, we have since moved on and are testing addressable TV, but for spring in this initiative, we chose just those latter two. So programmatic linear TV. For us, what we really liked about this was that we were on the big screen in people's living room. And we were able to reach our target audience a little bit differently than the standard TV and able to layer on our outdoor enthusiast targeting, as well as still maintain that cable network targeting and day part targeting. And then we also then went on to connected, so making sure we are across all these different screens as the consumers choosing to watch their connected TV, their video everywhere, and full episode players. This is where it got interesting with our targeting. We really wanted to make sure that we are aligned with weather, and we were in this area, we we're able to trigger our ads based on real-time weather data, layer on behavioral data, so if they're in market shopping for a jacket, making sure that we're appending that data, Demographic, we still were in those 18 markets in this category. Um, and then geographic and contextual targeting. The spots are really funny. We wanted to make sure that they were seen in content that aligned with that humor so it could really stand out. So that was also important for us. There was that element of it going into any of the content the consumer was watching, but we wanted to make sure it was also being viewed in um, more comedic television. Uh, one thing to note too, I, we're not gonna go into it because it wasn't programmatic TV, but we also were heavily invested in programmatic video. So we had heavy investment in YouTube um, and other kind of cross-screen um, plays to make sure that we are rounding out the video experience of our target. So results. So we're really happy. From a media standpoint, the media goals kind of really matched with what um, or the results matched with what we were trying to do, which is certainly be relevant um, where we needed to be, when it was raining, as it was raining, to hopefully increase that consideration. Um, more cost efficient, so we touched on this. Um, certainly wanting to be in market for a longer period of time, that sort of went hand in hand with the weather campaign. If you wanna address that need state of people needing to be dry, uh, hard to do when you're only in market for a week. So um, that really let us kind of be in market longer and, and achieve that goal. We're also to able to do a wider range of targeting. Um, when we did go into traditional TV of the adults aging to 49, we knew we had waste, but it was just what we had to do to get onto TV. So it was great that we were able to really have more efficiency in market by layering on um, that type of data that we knew was the right person we needed to reach versus mass. And also flexibility in market, this was key to us. So the first two weeks of our campaign, we actually were running with two different vendors and we did a bake off. Knowing that technology is constantly changing, um, this was a big investment for us, we wanted to make sure that we were choosing the right partner. So two weeks in, we evaluated the performance, um, it was based on a lot of core metrics like viewability, performance of hitting our target, and then went with the, the winner of that bake off to the rest of the campaign and market. So um, kind of the behind the scenes results, um, we did see a lift in consideration. We did a pre and post study um, that showed a lift in consideration in the time period we were in market for rainwear specifically. Um, we also saw that um, we had increased traffic to our site. So, um, we saw increased searches on rainwear. We saw increased product page views on those product category pages. 
Um, so using that, obviously, as a proxy for consideration. We felt really good about that. Um, and then finally, um, within that study, we did continue to see that we are um, moving the needle with respect to the brand affinity metric and that brand love and um, people responding, having seen the ad in those places that Columbia is a fun and approachable brand. So kind of picking off that, that metric for us too was really positive. I think the, one of the big learnings in that um, is it was a risk that we had to take. So we knew that certain TRP levels going into that market would see this type of success that we saw here. But going into that, it was we didn't know, is this too thin of a, a layer in market? We're all of a sudden in the same budget, we're in 18 markets and national. Yeah. Like how could that drive the similar like kind of increases that we wanted to see in our brand when that would have same budget would have only taken us into four markets? So for us that was a huge learning in that we can still drive our brand metrics. People were seeing our spot in market. They were driving their action and they were going on and searching for us um, that we weren't at too thin of levels in market. So learnings for next time. A big learning is that um, programmatic TV still has a lot of limitations. What we are doing in programmatic digital um, has been pretty advanced and we wanted to apply that same type of technology to programmatic TV, um, but it wasn't always there. So with the weather triggering, we'd love to, in high index linear, trigger that content based on snow in the future, based on rain, um, based on other factors, and it's just not there yet. So we had to adjust our expectations. We also need to make sure that we were allowing for extra hours of just analysis and insight development. We had a lot of people behind the scenes working on this from data analytics to performance marketing to the, the planning team and making sure that we are all aligned on how it's being set up and measured. And also just testing more um, as we go further, uh, kind of bucketing out our target segments and getting a better understanding of which segments are moving the needle and which segments are not. In the post study that we did, we found that men did not move the needle as much as women did. Um, so for us to, as we go into market and test more, is it A-B copy testing to different types of yeah. spots going to different audiences? Um, just now being able to just test like crazy uh, since we're now able to. And that's it. Those are our learnings.